Good evening. All right, let's see. Let's do some things again. How are you all doing? If someone can give me an AV, okay. That will be very helpful. Hopefully this is coming through. My mic it says it's happening. The old killer bits are flying out the tubes. And the internet is a series of them. So hopefully... Okay, we're seeing highs. AV is fine. Nice. We are back. Once again. Let's see who is here. Um, Azimut and AP Hacker, bug number 13, Davex Unit, Jace. Kalman Ter... Oh dear. Kalman Reti. Hello. Uh, left Air Joint... Mark Matu, Metian, Shimira, Cybersk. Sorry if I mispronounced that name. And good evening to you all in box two. Um, we hear you. We are coming through loud and clear. All the tubes are clear. Right, okay, so let's get started again. This episode is brought to you by Sleep. It is helpful. Um, and it is in short supply when you're doing a Kickstarter. Yes, it's been a good last uh, few days. I'm hoping, I'm hoping against hope, we are now actually back on a regular schedule. Thank you so much for bearing with me. Um, that Kickstarter went rather well. Um, and so, yes, last week we were doing an end of campaign stream where we played some Tailspire and answered some questions and generally just hung out with uh, a bunch of the bunch of the folks from the community, which was lovely, but it did rather collide with our pixel flinging. Um, so it's nice to be here. Um, so, yes, I am in real time and Technicolor. Um, so it's good to see you too. Um, all right, let's see where we were. So we are in the process of making... This is good, by the way. I got distracted before uh, the stream. Lisp is not based on Lambda Calculus. Well-researched article, um, or it seems to be. I haven't checked all the links yet, but that is very cool. Um, like many things, Lisp is surrounded in bullshit, and it is a detriment to the entire affair. Um, Lisp doesn't have syntax. It's got to be my least favorite of them all. Okay, so enough ranting, Chris. Let's actually have some fun. So we are currently experimenting with uh, GPU-based occlusion culling. Um, at least we tried to start that the other week, and I was too sleppy and had to run away. Um, so here is the link. Ha-ha! <laughs> In before Matty Yan. And um, yes, we're going to get going on this. So the first thing we did, uh, we did, we did, uh, was to take a bunch of spheres and render them um, into a depth buffer. So we have a pipeline which ideally would just have a depth buffer. Let me go to render for a second. Ideally, this pipeline here would only have... Only have a depth buffer? Yeah, sorry, it does only have a depth buffer. Would only have um, the vertex stage, and not the fragment stage. But there is a bug in Keppel due to a misunderstanding of mine about how GL works. Um, I didn't know that there was a time where it was useful to have um, a fragment stage, sorry, to not specify a fragment stage, but to also write out the result. Um, if you disable, how do they put it? If you completely disable um, everything after the vertex stages, you don't get any data written out to the depth buffer. Um, if you don't have a frag uh, fragment shader, like, yeah, it's still actually useful because it will still write things out to the depth buffer, and that's very cool. Um, but yes, we don't handle that properly in Keppel yet. Keppel assumes if you don't have fragment, you don't want any of that part of the pipeline at all and disables it all, which is bad. So I need to come up with a way of, you know, defining that inside Keppel that you do want that thing. Um, maybe I'll just make it like this, just nil. Um, so if you specify fragment explicitly but set it to nil, um, then we say, oh, yeah, so right, you... You do understand that you want the fragment portion of the pipeline, uh, but you don't want to use any particular stage, and that might work. So yes, we have a bug here. So we've currently got uh, a, a fragment stage left here. It doesn't even need to do this, um, but it does right now. So that was a lot of rambling to say there are bugs in Keppel, but we're working around them. And I have set up a few things for this stream. So all we've done so far is written some stuff into a depth buffer. We are then, according to the documentations we got to here, we're meant to create a hierarchical ZMIP chain, which means we are going to downsample this down to multiple levels. Um, and we are going to be downsampling using a max operator. So we're going to take four pixels at a time using a gather operation, which uh, both, this is DirectX, but, um, to, sorry, this is HLSL, um, but GLSL has this as well. We'll take those four fragments and we are going to um, 
so the four, the four pixels, and we take the max of each of them. So we don't want to downsample using max, um, which is cool. So we, we did that. Or sorry, we're going to be doing that next, and we'll generate this big chain of MIPS, and then we will do stuff with it. So it's going to look something like this. Um, tell you what, let's just start there, and then we'll talk about more about it. So going into here, I'm a bit almost jittery right now, because sleep is a novelty at the moment, so I'm glad to be back. I have put a few things in here. This uh, list of chain sizes will come to soon. It's going to be the size of the textures that we are populating. Um, we have this compute foo.lisp file, which we're going to get to soon. There's a compute shader we're going to run into. Um, and I just wanted to put this here with an example, a very, very simple uh, compute shader example in it. We're going to come to that. So it's just a nice base to start with. Um, I made a few tweaks to um, the blit frag function. So, well, I made one major tweak, and that was it, was that you pass in um, the power that the value is raised to, or you pass it in as a uniform. I'm going to move this down, actually, because i got feeling, yeah, um, that it wasn't going to be laid out very well. So there we go. Cool. Um, so yes, we pass in the power now, and this means you, when you say blit it, normally it's just raised to the power one, nothing happens, uh, but you can specify it power here. But Metian has rightly pointed out in the chat that there is a bug because what you're meant to return from a fragment shader is a vec4. Um, so we are going to do that like this, um, and that is now fine. If you don't do that, the other... Um, Channels can be unspecified. Some GPUs, they will just be zero, and some of them, they will be something garbagey. Like on macOS, apparently, the implementation there, which is 100% according to the spec, um, gives you garbage, and I've seen that other places as well. So that's cool. So I'll have to get that in. Save. And what else have I done? I've removed um, this pipeline that we weren't using and this function that we weren't using. And so we are good. So let's, uh, let's just come out of that. And we can see that little change we just made, the Metian change. So let's add append that to the existing commit. And then I'll push that. But with my ham fingers, I've hit, hit several keys at once. Um, and we are good to go. Failed to push some refs. Oh, no. What have I done? That's interesting. <laughs> well, really, I should be on episode 76 as well. That's odd. Hmm. Said failed to push, but it also looks like it worked. What is going on in, in GitHub land? Okay. Well, anyway, let's um, let's branch out from here to episode seventy six, and we'll push that as well. Episode seventy six at origin. Once that is done, think, think, think. Hopefully, yeah. There we go. Okay, pushed. Now we can follow along at home. So let's bring up stuff. Or oh, I can just press every key wrong. What's going to be my excuse today? Normally I blame it on tiredness. Now I should blame it on jitters. Okay, so. Pondabim, hello. Apologize for being late. Dude, I'm a week late. Don't worry about it. Um, and a week and an hour. There we go. So, right. We did this. Let's read about this a little. To remind ourselves, we're going to create a hierarchical Z MIP chain of the occlusion buffer using the max operator to produce each MIP level. Depending on what you render into the occlusion buffer, the high Z MIP chain could be used for other contexts, for example, to speed up volumetric fog calculations. Yeah, having a depth buffer that's already set up is kind of handy on some things. You can do lots of discards earlier. Okay, um, so. He does this downscale with a compute shader. We wrote our version of this last week. If we jump into our render, um, we can see here's his downscale thing, and here's our version right here. And it's kind of interesting. It's based on this idea that we can do a texture gather, um, and then we can take the max of all of those components and return those. So let's just try that out. We've got a texture over here. And if we look at base, let's just bring base down here. Um, we have this sampler ready to go. So an occlusion buffer sampler, bam. This is our texture 2D, happens to be this one. Um, 
So what we're going to do is we're going to call um, this function that is a GPU function from here. So we're going to go downscale um, and we are going to pass in a vector 2, 0, 0. Um, and we are going to pass in the sampler, which is the occlusion buffer la, 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 sampler. I'm going to move this down to a new line so it's easier to read. And we get back 1. Apparently that's correct. Is it now? Is it? I'm guessing we might be sampling down here. Um, so, what it would be cool to see is what is coming back from this texture gather thing. So what we could do is if we change this up a bit, let's say, so let's do a fun call G. This is a GPU function call. And we're going to need a function to run. So actually, let's just take this one and modify it. Uh, we'll make, turn this into a lambda because we're going to do it inline. It doesn't need a name because it's a lambda. Um, and we are just going to do the texture gather. Boop, boop, boop. Right, the reason we happen to do fun call G and make this a lambda is this function, because we defined it in Kettle, um, is a function we can call directly. We generate all the magic and stuff like this, so you can do that. It's slow, but it's useful for debugging. Um, whereas texture gather is just a straight GLSL function and not being written in Keppel, it doesn't have that architecture around it. So let's have a look. Um, yes, that should be it. And we don't need downscale anymore. And the arguments we pass in go away are going to be the vector 2 and the occlusion buffer sampler. So let's see what happens. So we can get back that all of them are 1. So let's Let's try sampling at a different point. If we change this to 0, 1, which I'm hoping is up here, um, we get 0.93 all the way along, actually. So all four of the um, of the uh, uh, pixels being read out of the texture there are, uh, are, uh, this have the same value, which makes sense from what we're looking at here. It would be cool to kind of get a boundary. So what we could do is let's just iterate down this thing and see if we can hit an edge. Um, we'll just do it in a really ugly way and you'll see how slow this code is. Do for i below uh, 1.0 um, I'm actually going to do yeah, float 1 by 0.0 yeah, 0.1, something like that. Um, yeah, collect fun call, blah blah blah. Let's just see what happens we should get a bunch of results. Let's have a look. Wow. There's lots of them. God, lots of them are the same value. We should see some differences down here, though. Let's do this. So it's a little, see if I can spot anything at all. Oh, you're an idiot, Chris. You haven't actually said where you're sampling. Fool of a took. Right, so... Let's just try that. I'm just going to put this and do 0 0.1, which I'm hoping is around here somewhere. Um, and I let's let's just see what happens. Right. In the meantime, chat. Dum dum dum. <laughs> Cyber saying pimps are always late. It, make, it really makes me want to kind of quote Gandalf in in the wrong way. A pimp is never late. They arrive exactly when they mean to. Um, okay. I'm still pointing with my fingers. Thank you. I, I would, didn't want to break that tradition. And it's good to know that I haven't. Uh, okay, here's an example of what we want. Here we have um, four pixels that are being sampled in a 2x2 two two cluster. Um, each value is being returned in one of the elements um, of this vector 4. And you can see some of them are different. And that's cool. Um, then it's going to take the max of these. That's what this thing is going to do. Um, so what we can do, what can we do with this? Well, let's just run this again um, with collect. Let's just make this a list. List of this thing and that. Ugly as fook, but it's going to give us some data. Hey, Indigo, how you doing? <laughs> yeah, I'm saying since stream one, absolutely. Um, two Lords of the Rings references in two minutes. A man after my own heart. I found the references I needed and I stuck with them, like pointing. Um, 
Yes, I have certainly uh, disqualified my disqual disqualified my for guide. Yes, I have many of the words, and they are the best ones. Okay, so here, let's take this one. If we, uh, why am I so bad at all of the things? Top tip: If you're not good at typing things while people are watching, don't have people watch. Um, okay, so oh yeah, I should make that a bit bigger so it can be read by human beings. Right, so we have got back that value, and I kind of want to get back to this call here. Hopefully, if we do this. Okay, so we can see different values here. And we can see that the result, 989, 989, 989. Okay, so 9895, 9905, yes. 9894, which is less. 9894, which is less. 9894, which is less. Cool. So we did get the max out of those. Phew, that was a very arduous way of saying it works. Um, but at least we can play with it and see. If you waste time, justify it. Um, okay, so, great, we've got a thing. Um, what do we do now? Well, we can probably remove this, because I'm pretty sure it works now. We need to get downscaling, so we need to generate a bunch of stuff. Now, we could generate a texture and um, generate its mipmap levels. And but we want to render into those, which means we're going to have to attach them to an FBO, um, which we can do. It's tempting to attach them to the same FBOs. We don't need lots of FBOs, but that will work because every attachment in an FBO does need to be the same size. Um, so we're going to need a lot of FBOs. And we could just be lazy and make lots of textures as well. Is it worth doing that? Um, Well, let's just make sure that I haven't completely forgotten how everything works. So let's do make texture nil. Uh, dimensions are going to be uh, 100 by 100. Doesn't matter, we're not going to use it. And the element type is going to be float. And we're going to have that. Cool. So depth of temp 0 is going to be that. And then we are going to call text ref on uh, temp 0. And we're just going to take the default level from there. Bam, we get a GPU array. So, the question of course is, can we make an FBO? <laughs> can we remember how Lisp works? Um, where the first attachment is that GPU array. Okay, apart from the horrible error. Oh, of course, yes, this is the incorrect syntax. I really need to, we did this last time as well. In fact, there's been a number of times where that is just a really bad error. So we should improve that at some point. Today is not that day. Today is the day we make excuses. Okay, so, um, wow, I really hate it when that happens. You get some weird fucking lag. Oh, give me strength. Um, okay, make FBO. And the first attachment is going to be attachment zero, and it's going to be based on the text ref attempt zero. Okay, so, um, it's saying attachment is not compatible with this array. Yes. Okay, so what we did is hit a bolt, which is no problem. We can just say play again. Um, what we did apparently is we have temp zero, which is a texture. And it has an image format of depth component 24. That's exciting because I don't remember making. Ah, I know why. I know exactly why this is. I said def var. Um, with the new texture I made. But, as you can see, this texture is 512 by 512, not the 100 by 100 we made. And, that, and that's because def var doesn't replace the binding that already exists. So I'm been a muppet. And this just shows I was playing around with things before the stream. Hurrah. Um, okay. Lord of Lisp, where? I hope he's not here. I'm making a bloody ham of this. Right. Um. <laughs> oh. But in the darkness, multiple values bind them. That is that is an acceptable joke. <laughs> that will be maintained. Um, okay. 
Good lord. Baggers Baggins, I'll take that name. The Land of Lisp illustrations are fantastic. They should always be in mind. Um, okay. <laughs> That's just fucking Lord of the Rings jokes in there for now. So I will come back to it. But uh, not yet. Okay. Um, what have we got? So it was having an issue because the texture we're looking at, which is temp0, was already set up and it had depth compare component 24, which was confusing because when I said make texture like this... I said element type to be float. Um, so let's set f temp zero to be that. Fuck you, other texture. Um, let's try and make an FBO again. Hurrah, we can. Passing in a GPU array. Cool. So we should be able to make a bunch of FBOs using the various MIP layers of a texture. That sounds pretty good. Um, and we're going to make these sizes. So if you remember way back when we started this mess, um, I decided for simplicity just to keep this as a 512 by 512 thing. This doesn't look like it's 512 by 512 because everything's off to the side at the moment. We're kind of, we don't have enough space in these meager 1920 by 1080 pixels. So we'll have to make do with a little lost, but that's okay. So we do not need a, a buffer a texture that is 512 by 512 because we already have that. Um, it is what we are calling our occlusion buffer. There it is, 512 by 512. We need the sizes smaller than that. That's interesting, actually. Because it would be kind of cool. Hmm. That's the problem. We can't have a color format as the depth attachment of an FBO. And we do just want to write the depth. So that means we've got two textures. We've got this one, and then we've got all the others which are floats. It's not great, but I can't think of a different way of doing that right now. Let's just try some. Okay, so let, this is slightly different. I got this list of sizes just ready because I thought it would be handy, but it might not be actually. So let's do this, 256 by 256, and it's gonna be a float, but we're also gonna say that we are going to mip map true, and we can also see that by default, uh, generate mip maps is true. Um, so when this is set to true, this also means we'll generate the mipmaps for you. It's not really necessary because we don't have any data in there yet, but also we don't care about performance right now, so let's do that. Um, so I'm going to call this chain text, uh, def uh, uh, chain texture, nil chain text. Let's go and add it to our Functions that get called when we call reset, because we're going to break things eventually. Uh, we're going to free chain text, assuming it's chain text, assuming it's there, and then we're going to set it to, um, well, this. The texture that we need, if not the texture we deserve. Right, so that is done. Um, if we have a look at that texture that we created, um, we can see that it has nine mipmap levels, which is pretty good. That's what we would expect. Um, and we can get them too, actually. Let's uh, set f temp zero um, to be that texture instead. We are leaking a few textures, but also it'll be fine. Um, so temp zero, let's call text ref um, zero on that. Oh, that's not how you use that function, Chris. You wrote it, how do you not know this? Um, let's call mipmap level on this. So that is the 256 by 256 one, mipmap level one. Why? Um, oh, because you're an idiot, Chris. Because I'm doing text ref star. We did temp one for a reason. Uh, was it temp zero? Temp zero, there we go. Let's try this again. Mip level zero of temp zero, Chris is 256 by 256. Great. MIP level 1 is 1 to 8 by 1 to 8. 2. I think you see the pattern. Okay, so this continues on all the way to MIP map level 9, uh, which is 1 by 1. Groovy. Okay, so assuming that that's been made, uh, we need to populate that. So we actually need a bunch of FBOs. So let's go and make our chain FBOs. Now I'm just assuming we need lots of FBOs here. If I'm being an idiot, and we can get away with them. Please do tell me how. 
Um, but until then, we do this loop for I below um, texture mip map levels of chain text. So that gives us this this number here is how many mip map levels it has. Below that, we are going to do what? We are going to um, say the array is equal to text ref, basically what we've done over here. And instead of this number, it's going to be i. So that gets us the GPU array we're interested in. And then, now we'll be catching up with chat soon. I need the bell. We need to do the bell episode. God damn it. After this, maybe we look at P uh, Pico Lisp or whatever it's called. I've got to do something with those Arduinos. Okay, so then we are going to collect, um, and what's it going to be? Make FBO, um, where the attachment is, there's only one attachment, we don't need the depth attachment, and it is the array. Hopefully, this uh, chain FBOs, this will work. No, it doesn't work. Texture index out of range. Boo. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. You have my attention. Ah, chain text is the 512 by 512 one. Maybe I should have done this correct. Maybe I should have spoken correct too, because it's correctly, Mr. Bagley. Right, okay, so let's try chain FBOs again. Right, now we have a bunch of FBOs. Um, and that should be in chain FBOs, which it is. Goody. We'll inspect that, and we will also inspect chat. What's going on over here? Um... <laughs> oh, God. Okay, some bad Dell puns in there now, too. Those will not be repeated. AK Karam, hello! Um, Indigo is saying, I love that it's called a mip map. It's such a hilarious word. Yes. Um, Indigo, you live in libraries. What's your favorite hilarious word? Um, okay, so let's see what's going on. Um, seeing the haircut change, but Emacs prevails. Yes, Emacs will never die, but my hair... You know, they get to a certain age where you just have to let them go. Um, it's not... It's not advisable to, you know, raise them in captivity their whole lives. We did our best. Um, quality streams use variables named temp something. Absolutely. And with no earmuffs because uh, <laughs> because I will type those wrong far too often is actually the reason. Um, inspect chat? Yes. All right, so... Apparently, this has one color array, and it has size 256 by 256. This is pretty hard to actually look at this here. Um, do I have a thing for getting all the FBO attachments out of something? Attachment. There's nothing for getting all the attachments? Boo. Okay, we'll have to do that in future. Um, but let's look at a few of them anyway. So we'll do attachment of um, element of chain FBOs. So we get the first element of that. And we'll look at attachment zero because they only have one attachment each. Okay, first one is 256 by 256. Next one's 120 by 128, 64 by 64, and so on until one by one. Oh, goody, it's worked. Cool, so we now have... Um, a texture with loads of MIP levels. We have a chain of F... Well, just a list of FBOs. Uh, don't know why I've got my chain. It just seemed right at the time. Um, it's never right. Oh, we've got to free that chain too. So we can do map and nil and free and chain FBOs. Cool. That should do it. And we need samplers too, actually. If we're going to read from these textures in on the GPU, we need samplers. So let's make a chain of samplers too. Oh, lots of things to set up before we can do anything exciting. Um, but that's fine. Okay, so what do we do? We will... Um, we will sample it. So how are we going to do that? So let's look at... Well, actually, it's kind of interesting. So 
So we need a sampler for each MIT level. So let's look at our chain text. Oh. Is this going to work? I'm not sure it will. And the reason it might not is because, let's go and look at our gather here. So our downscale uh, like uh, pipeline which we want to run is doing texture gather. Texture gather, if we go and look at the GLSL documentation, has an interesting quality if I remember. Level, oh, come on, uh, base. It does not specify which MIT map level um, you want to read from, you want to gather from. Which is interesting. Which means if we can't specify which MIT level, I think we need to have them as separate textures, don't we? So maybe I was right in thinking we need those sizes on hand. Ah, okay, right, okay. Again, if anyone's seeing the, the stupidity in that logic, because I'm not thinking this through, I'm just thinking enough going, okay, I think we've got a problem here, so I should um, I should change it up. Um, chain textures, and we will change this to, let's just call this because we don't need it anymore. Um, map nil, because we're gonna have multiple of them now, we're gonna have a chain of textures. Um, chain text is down here. So this is now going to be a loop as well. It's going to look a lot like this, but collecting this. What have I forgotten? Okay, so we're making a texture with the dimensions. Well, actually we can do for size in that array up there, chain sizes, there we go. And then this will be the dimensions, size, we could actually just do this in map car, can't we? Ah, fuck it, it's already written, don't worry about it. Um, this will be chain textures. And then chain of FBOs is going to be getting, I think when we make a FBO, you can pass in the GPU array or you can just pass in the whole texture and it will take the base. So let's do that, let's do um, loop for text in chain of textures um, we don't need this and then we can just make an FBO where we're using text will that work here is the question um, we just will go and free those FBOs means we don't need those original ones now how dare you um, that's exciting I wish I had time to unpack what that was. Really? Ah, uh, adult. Um, I feel like I've got some old code lurking around here. I'm just gonna do a recompile. Oh, fuck's sake. Okay, right, fix up time. This is what you get when you actually have the time to prepare. I should have just closed the whole session down and restarted again. That's okay, we can work around this. What's going on in chat? Um, <laughs> Sulu going, yeah, muffs ruin the duality of syntax. I'm guessing that's a, uh, oh, what's that thing called? Um, Lead over lambda thing. Man, that book, that book was really enjoyable. I disagree with lots of it, but it was a really enjoyable read. Um, <laughs> don't want my globals getting cold without their earmuffs. Absolutely. Um, that's great. Okay, 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 okay. Um, what have we got now? So we've got a chain of textures that is being made from the chain of sizes. Make a load of textures, then we make a load of FBOs. Doesn't this work? <sighs> Cannot free a texture back GPU array, free the texture containing this array. Oh, okay. That is fine. That means that something has the wrong thing in it. Wait a second, let's have a look. Chain of textures and chain of FBOs. Has textures in it, that's fine. 
Why have our chain of FBOs got... No, they've got FBOs in them. Occlusion buffer has a GPU array in it. There we go. Um, so we actually need to free the GPU array texture. Okay, we will get there. So we make we make a load of textures, and then we make a load of FBOs, and we wanted to do a load of samplers as well. Um, so let's do that. Chain of samplers seems we have to get everything started again. Um, and we will now sample that texture. And I don't think we want to do wrapping. So we're going to say wrap is going to be clamp to edge, border, edge. There we go. Let's try that. All right, let's have a look. Let's see if we can start this guy up again. Yes. Okay. Well, that's a really boring set of spheres. I actually want to stop it. Play stop. Play start. Why is that suddenly so dull? I can see th there are some spheres in there, but they're really dull. Um, let's have a look. Oh, look, Blitit hasn't been given a power. Oh, wow. Yeah, I definitely had some... Uh, I definitely had some experiments that I was doing over the left over. Some experiments I was doing earlier left over in the session. The rain in Spain falls mainly upon my ability to speak. Okay. Balls. And now, hopefully, we have a chain of sizes. We have a chain of textures. We have a chain of FBOs. And we have a chain of samplers. Blur. There we go. Good. Finally, we can do something. So we have... Um, now we want to do the actual downsampling that we've been preparing to do for ages. What time is it? Jesus Christ. We're already 40 minutes in and I've achieved very little. But I have made a lot of noise. And to many people, that is the same as work. Coffee, because jittering can only be improved by increasing it. Hmm. Lisbon slurpy sounds. Right, so what have we done here? This was the bit where we made this occlusion buffer. So now we need a thing to defund gen um, mip chain. That'll be the name I use. So far, it does nothing. And we are going to call it here. So what we want to do is we are going to loop across all of our samplers. And we're going to call the downscale thing um, and render it into the next FBO in the chain. So let's see if we can set that up. So we will go loop for um, sampler in now there's chain samplers but we actually want one more and that's the uh, 512 by 512 one. Oh, wait a second there's a 512 one by 512 one here chris you made yet more mistakes excellent so that's very interesting oh i bet I'm going to change this def parameter so it definitely gets updated when we recompile things. I know, I know. Somehow I did that. Are you sure? Oh no, it's because I had some had things selected. More haste, less speed. Um, play start. Let's try that again. Okay, balls. Chain of Samplers, now it's 256 all the way down. Cool, chain of samplers, chain of FBOs. Assume that's right. Let's just get the length of um, this and the length of the one before it. They're both nine, good. Okay, so they look probably correct. And chain of textures, 256. Um, good, let's try this.
Okay, so Metian has linked to something. <laughs> oh my god, I haven't seen that picture in so long. That's fantastic. Um, past baggers is present baggers worst enemy. Absolutely. Um, not so much when I'm coding Tailspire. Like, sometimes there I actually look out for myself. But um, <laughs> when I'm doing this, for sure. There's no pressure. There's no pressure. The stream stuff is absolutely fine. It's the same as normal coding. Um, okay. Let's go down to our downscale thing again. So we don't just want... This is the point I was trying to make. We don't just want these guys. We also want... Occlusion Buffer Sampler. Look, 512 by 512. Um, and you can also spot another error here. These all have mitmap levels, which we don't need them to have. Because uh, we won't be using them. Um, let's look at mitmap T. We can get rid of that. Um, let's get rid of... Fuck it, let's, re let's reset again. Uh, reset occlusion buffer. Does that work? work? We can do that. Ooh. Um, I wonder if we broke anything doing that. That'll be interesting. All right. Okay. So then down here, loop for sampler in this. So the list of all of the samplers, including the one that's holding this. Okay. And then. For what do we need to do? We need each of the FBOs. For FBO in chain of FBOs. And then we're going to do something. What are we going to do? We are going to. It's a good question. We are going to do something very sim similar to this. We're going to say with FBO bound. Um, and the FBO we are binding is the FBO we want to write into. We are going to call this function, downscale it. That was the wrong way to do that. Let's get rid of these. Oh, I love it when Emacs fights me. Um, Okay, now we need to check that that function is actually kosher. So let's go and have a look. So we call downscale it, passing in a sampler. It goes and does stuff, and we can assume that that's right. A safe assumption to make. Mm -hmm. All right, and we're not passing in this, we're passing in sampler. And let's see if that worked. It didn't crash, and this was being called. So let's see what happens if we take various elements of elements of the chain of samplers, the world of tomorrow. You might have seen that that was very slightly lower resolution. Ooh. You may have noticed that that is even lower resolution. More oohs will ensue as we increase the numbers and we see that we have done something that looks like it might be almost perhaps maybe sampling. Um, down. Down scaling. That's good. Okay, so maybe that's working. That's kind of cool. All the way down to this one. Yes, where it's just one. So that's cool. Um, I'm pretty optimistic about that. So I think we're generating our MIP chain now. And once we've done that, we get to the exciting bit, which is, so we're getting something like this. Okay, so 0, 1, 2, 3. So R3 hopefully will look like something like, ah, well, he's got a slightly different setting here. Let's try to. There we go. Not too far off. We don't have as many things near the camera, apparently, which is interesting. I wonder if I can... Yeah, I can just fly around. There we go. Whoa. There we go. How about that? That's a bit better. Be nice to get some... Can't really see the difference between here and here. We are just throwing, an e uh, a, throwing a power on it, so who knows. But that's cool. That's fun to fly around. I shouldn't be distracted. Um, okay, so... 
Next, I packed data for instances of props in a structured buffer. The structured buffer, I think for us, is going to be um, an SSBO. The world transform as well as the access align bounding box should be enough. At this point, you can decide whether to let the GPU perform Preston culling along with the occlusion culling meaning that you will have to pass in data for all the instances in your world or do the frustum culling on the CPU and pass data only for the potentially visible ones. Cool. Um, I don't think we need it. I think we can ignore frustum culling for now. If that's wrong, we'll see. Um, since occlusion will take place on the GPU and the results consumed by the GPU as well without CPU intervention, we need to use... Okay, so later on, the goal is, so we're going to have, we've got this, and now we're going to do some magic, which decides whether the various things should be rendered at all, because we don't want to render things that behind other things. And then um, we're going to render the things that aren't occluded. Now, because all the information is on the GPU, we don't want to bring it back to the CPU just to dispatch the call. What we can use is an indirect draw, um, which is called something slightly different in uh, GL, but in um, in what do we call it? In uh, in Keppel, we call it multi-map. That was it, multi-map G. Um, so we have a GPU array which specifies the um, things to draw, specifies the draw calls, and then we can dispatch that. I did a real shitty job of explaining that. Basically, there's a buffer that's going to that's gonna contain the information that's needed to make draw calls. We're going to pack that on the GPU side based on what we know from here, and then we're going to dispatch it using something like this. Um, the functionality, sorry, this is functionally the same as drawing instance. Uh, but the main difference being that it receives the arguments through a buffer on the GPU is the DirectX version um, is the OpenGL version of this DirectX thing. Woo. Okay. So occlusion culling is implemented with a compute shader based on the code from Stephen Hill's blog. Now, on our streams, we have never visited compute shaders. And I have done very little of them myself. And the last time I did them, it was quite a while ago. So we should actually take a bit of a tour through the world of compute shaders. It's the second time we've referenced World of Tomorrow. Um, so we're going to go through this. And that's when the other file called compute foo will come in. Because what I put here, let's actually bring up the REPL again and scoot it to the side. Repile. We have the code, the, the uh, HLSL code that was here. I've copied that in. And then here I've got a very simple function for calling a, a very simple compute um, pipeline uh, here and a very simple function to call that compute thing. So let's go through the bits of what we have. We have defined a struct, which is our SSBO test data. We've given it a specific layout um, and it has one field and that's called vowels and it's an array of 100 integers. And then we've got our GPU function, which is going to be our compute stage. And it is, it has something at the top, which is a bit weird called local size. We're not going to worry about that yet, but then it does something very simple. It says that it is going to get the array SSBO test data vowels, this guy here, from whoop, which is what's passed in as a uniform, this buffer, this SBO buffer, um, we are going to get the GL workgroup ID, which we'll find out what that means soon. We're going to get its X components. We know this is a vector. In fact, I can probably look up the documentation for this. Workgroup ID contains the index of the workgroup currently being operated on by the compute shader. All of that will be revealed in time. Um, and Emacs does that thing I hate most. This is this is also why Emacs, as much as I love it, cannot be used as a um, window manager very well because it's very keen on resizing things when new buffers open. Um, so I've used um, it as a window manager for a long time and I'm about to switch away from it again. I use Stump on this machine, but uh, Emacs on another one. Okay, so 
we get the work group ID, we get its X component because it's a vector. Um, we turn that into an integer so we can use it to, to index into this array. And then we set whatever, uh, set that position in the array to that same value, the work group ID. And we return nothing because compute shaders don't return anything unlike every other stage we've dealt with so far. Oh, is that true? What does tessellation, I'm sure there's some tessellation things that don't actually strictly return things. They emit things, it's slightly different. Anyway, then we make a pipeline which only stages compute and we just specify its name. Um, there's no arguments passed in as in args, there's only uniform arguments, so we don't need to specify those in the type. Then down here, we make a GPU array of dimension one of this type, this one here. Remember, we only need one because the array we're interested in is, is here, the 100 things. Um, we make an SSBO out of that GPU array. So this is so we can pass it in um, here. And then we map over this pipeline, this one, sorry, this pipeline, um, with a compute space, which we'll also talk about soon. But if we look at the arguments, we can see it has an X size, a Y size, and a Z size. Ooh, three components. Could it be related to GL workgroup ID? Yes. Um, so it, we, we're mapping over a compute space rather than what is normal, which is a, a stream of vertices. Um, and we're passing in this SSBO we made here into whoop, which is here. And then we wait, we make a GPU fence and we wait for everything to complete. And then we pull the contents of this SSBO, which will hopefully be populated by the compute shader. And test compute and we run it and we can see that we have numbers. We have numbers from zero to 99. Ooh, a workspace of a hundred things and an array of a hundred elements. And it's populated each one uh, with numbers in order, and it did that on the GPU. Nice. Okay, so that's the world's simplest compute shader. Um, and we want to do something a bit more advanced. <laughs> we want to do this thing. Um, but we need to learn a bit more about uh, compute shaders first, because we're going to have to translate a HS HLSL compute shader into GLSL. And so we need a bit more of an idea of what this stuff all is. Hopefully it shouldn't be too bad, but if we get it translated today, I'll be kind of surprised. This is going to keep us busy for a while. Um, thank you, Pomp2Pimp, Pomp, for linking the GL article for Compute Shader, because we are going to go... <laughs> okay, Pomp2Pimp. Pomp. Um, I'll change my heart, though. That's awesome. Um, right. What are we doing? Okay, so let's look at compute shaders. A compute shader is a sta shader stage that is used entirely for computing arbitrary information. Hooray! While it can do rendering, it's generally used for tasks not related to drawing triangles and pixels. We already had a pipeline set up for that, and it's rather optimized for the job. Um, when I look at this sampler stuff, I really want to uh, do nearest on the filtering because... Yeah, then all of this will be nice and sharp. It annoys me. Oh, actually, that might have been what I was looking for when I was looking at gather. Oh, God, this is such a distraction. But let's have a look anyway. I want to understand things. Um, texture gather, doot, 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 and more doots. And when we look down here, filtering's not specified. Damn it. I thought this ignored filtering. Hmm. Okay, I, I can't remember where I read that, but it is interesting to me. Anyway, back to this. Oh, compute space, this might be relevant. Okay, while it can do rendering, it's generally used as a task, but not for that. Cool, execution model. Compute shaders operate differently from other shader stages. All of the other shader stages have a well-defined set of input values. Some built in and some user defined. Um, the frequency at which the shader stage ex executes is specified by the nature of that stage. For example, Vertex shaders execute once per input vertex, um, plus, you know, instancing and stuff like this. Though some executions can be skipped via caching. That is interesting. I really want to know more about that. If you know more about this, please send a stamped address envelope to bbc.co.uk slash where is my postbox? I haven't used one in years. Um, 
Right, so fragment shader execution is defined by the fragments generated from rasterization process. Yes, so that's how it normally is, but compute shaders work very differently. The space that a compute shader operates is largely abstract. It's up to each compute shader to decide what the space means. The number of compute shader executions is defined by the function used to execute the compute operation. Ooh, that is very interesting. Most important of all, Compute shaders have no user-defined inputs and no outputs at all. No outputs one. Well, no inputs and no outputs. Let's go back here. Well, that explains, if we go back to compute foo, why this chappy here has no non-uniform arguments and returns values, which is nothing. Um, Indigo is saying, put it, put it on a floppy and strap it to a postal pigeon. Exactly. And Sergeant Creef wants to fax it. You may. Yes. Um, I don't actually have a fax machine, but my secretary starts screaming in binary and then paper comes out of her ears. It's amazing. Highly disturbing and will probably kill her, but it's a good skill. Um, right. Where will we go? I completely distracted myself with my own bullshit. Um, we were talking about the computer space. Yes. Um... Okay, we actually were here. Right. The built-in inputs only define where in the space of execution a particular compute shader invocation is. This is all rather vague. What does it mean? Therefore, if a compute shader wants to take some values as input, it's up, the up to the shader itself to fetch that data via texture access, arbitrary image load, shader storage blocks, ooh, SSBO, somehow this is relevant, yeah, um, or other forms of interface. Similarly, if a compute shader is to actually compute anything, it must explicitly write to, uh, to an image or shader storage block. Uh, we will be using these shader storage blocks, these SSBOs, um, because there's really no advantage for us of writing just in texture images. I think that's both of these features were added in the same GLSL version, and shader blocks are really ideal for this. I'm not actually sure what cases writing to textures is more useful. Again, if you know that, attach it to the same um, fax, email, letter, boot with uh, a braille imprint that you can kick into my face and I can read in the mirror. Um, compute space. These. Okay, so let's let's add some coffee and look at the chat before we have more nonsense. It's a miracle I ever get anything done. Um, if I remember correctly, GL doesn't guarantee a vertex shader in invocation of every point if it can prove the output will be the same as a previous invocation Ooh, there's some kind of basic memoization going on in there but i'm not sure exactly when you could tell that that is very interesting uh coffee at this hour <laughs> it's i i don't have a problem sleeping regardless I, I can have a full coffee and go to bed and i will sleep fine much to the annoyance of my husband who finds it much harder to sleep um regardless of caffeine intake um, okay, so we're back to things being abstract. There is a concept, there is a dream um, of a work group. This is the smallest amount of compute operations that the user can execute. Or to put it another way, the user can execute some number of work groups. Okay, so there's going to be some number of work groups. The number of work groups that a compute operation is executed with is defined by the user when they invoke the compute operation. To me, this is related to our compute space. The space of these groups is three-dimensional, so it has a number of x, y, and z groups. Any of these can be one, so you can perform a two-dimensional or one-dimensional uh, compute operation instead of a 3D one. This is useful for processing image data or linear arrays of a particle system or whatever. Um, and that is what we have here. So we only specify one dimension. And the other ones default to one. Hooray. Mm, okay, so when the system actually computes the work groups, it can do so in any order. That's good. Um, so if 
it is given a work group set of 321, or 312, sorry. It could execute group 00 first and then skip to another one, skip to another one. So your compute shader should not reply on the order which groups are processed. Again, we're throwing to things to the GPU to do lots of stuff in parallel, and if things are having to be done in a certain order, we're going to hurt ourselves there. So that's not too surprising. Do not think that a single work group is the same as a single compute shader invocation. There's a reason why it's called a group. Within a single work group, there may be many compute shader invocations. How many is defined by the compute shader itself? Not by the call that executes it. Executes it. Words. This is known as the local size of the work group. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, so this is how we say uh, to Vario, our GLSL, our Lisp to GLSL compiler that we have in the background, what the local size would be. And so this is saying in each of the dimensions, we are having one invocation per work group. And our work group is has a hundred. Like we're having a hundred work groups. Each of them are going to invoke this thing one time, uh, which makes sense. That's good. So this work group ID here, that's very interesting. This work group ID is about this. And that's why it's saying about groups, even though we're using it just as a single index. It's all coming back to me. It's not. I'm just learning it again. Okay. Every compute shader has three-dimensional local size. Again, sizes can be one to allow 2D or 1D local processing. This defines the number of invocations of the shader that will take place within each work group. Therefore, if the local size of a compute shader is 128 one by one, and you execute it with a work group of 16, 8 to 64, then you'll get over a million separate shader invocations. Nice. Each invocation will have a set of inputs that uniquely identifies that specific invocation. That's cool. That suggests that not only is there a GL workgroup ID, there would be a GL something ID. Um, let's have a look for things that end with ID. Global invocation ID. Mm. Um, there is a, so there's a workgroup ID, there's an invocation ID, there's a local invocation ID. I wonder what the difference between those are. Um, there's a primitive ID, there's a sample ID. Okay, so we're into something else now. It's gotta be that invocation stuff. Yes, it's gotta be those invocation IDs. Hopefully we'll see that soon. This distinction is useful for doing various forms of image compression or decompression. The local size will be the size of a block of image data. Um, 8 by 8 for example, while the group count will be the image size divided by the block size. Yeah, okay. Each block is processed as a single work group. What does that mean? Um, is that the first time we've seen the phrase work group in this? No, it's not. Oh, no, no, sorry. Okay, no, that... Fuck's sake, Chris. Work group is the... Uh, is the term we've been looking at before now. For some reason, I thought it was some other kind of group. I think like invocation group or something. Yes, okay, so we have a compute space that defines the number of work groups. Then we have a work group ID, which is gonna tell us which one of those we're currently in. And we have a local size of saying the number of invocations of this that are happening per work group. Nice. That might stick soon. The individual invocations of within a work group actually go away now. Um, will be executed in parallel. The main purpose of this distinction between work group count and local size is that the different compute shader invocations within a work group can communicate through a set of shared variables and special functions. That's very interesting. So invocations in different work groups within the same compute shader dispatch cannot effectively communicate, not without potentially deadlocking the system. Right, so by having a local size that is greater than one in all of these, all of the invocations in this um, local group will be able to write to some shared memory, read from some shared memory, um, which is very cool, but also introduces all kinds of racy kind of conditions into it as well, which means we're going to have barriers. 
Dispatch. Compute shader is not part of the regular rendering pipeline, so when executing a drawing command, the compute shader linked into the current program or pipeline is not involved. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, there are two functions to initiate compute operations. Um, though they are not drawing commands, they are rendering... Oh, so... Although they are not drawing commands, they are rendering commands, so they can be conditionally executed. You have my attention. What does that even mean? Rendering command. OpenGL rendering commands are any drawing command, frame buffer blitting operations, frame buffer clearing operations, compute dispatch operations. Okay, fine. Um, that's in lesson three. Okay, conditional rendering is a mechanism for making the execution of one or more rendering commands Conditional on the result of an occlusion query. Holy bejesus. I had no idea about this. There is so much random crap in the GLSL spec. This is probably really useful for something, but I do not have time to read that now. So otherwise we'll be off on tangents for days. Oh, bug number 13 had to leave. Sorry, I didn't see that, mate. Take care. Jace is saying, CUDA, call, CUDA calls work groups block, if I'm uh, if I'm reading correctly. Blocks. Ah, cool. Makes sense. I think there's also... is. I'm wondering if work groups is similar to warps, or if I'm getting that mixed up with something more hardware, hardware level. Um... <laughs> Um, Sergeant Creeper saying I'm sort of similar on the coffee thing but I don't normally drink this late uh, I don't normally drink coffee this late because I think tea is a more appropriate evening drink it is a good evening drink it's a good everything drink um, <laughs> one of them saying beer is appropriate in the mornings if you don't sleep yes um, and we're getting discussions on good times for different drinks we have the CUDA information. Sadly, bug number 13 had to go. Doot, doot, doot. AK Kram is asking anyone to try the next browser. I haven't yet. I mean, I really miss using um, Conqueror, not the KDE Conqueror, but the Conqueror that was um, a kind of emacs -y browser back in the day that was built on top of Firefox, but the thing was it was using Zool for its kind of interaction layer, so when Zool died, it went too. Uh, then I was using, I can't remember what it was called, Vimperator in Firefox for ages, and then their new plugin system killed that. And I have not been able to get onto the new ones of those yet. So I'm, I do really miss my kind of emacs -y browsing. So next browser does seem very interesting, but I can't live without good plugins. Um, again, like the different, not so much the tree tabs, but I need no script and ad block because I, I just can't stand the internet without them. Um, Conqueror was great. Yes, it was. Um, okay. So Jason's saying, yeah, warps are lower level. A warp is of a fixed size. Right. Okay. Um, on the said in the cores, I've worked with the 32, um, cores wide. Idea is all the cores in the warp share a program counter more or less. Yes, it's big, wide SIMD machines running in sync. Oh, I'm looking forward to digging back into that again. It's been a long time. Okay, so yeah, this is the normal GL command that we would use um, to dispatch compute. So I guess you would bind the program or use the program, um, and then you would do this. Now we do it slightly differently in Kevl. We allow you to make a compute space and then we map over the pipeline. This keeps the syntax almost the same as it is with doing anything else. Um, and yeah, I don't know, it's just handy. The num groups parameters define the work group count in three dimensions. The numbers cannot be zero. There are limitations on the number of work groups that can be dispatched. Limitations is highlighted. Doot. Oh, compute shaders. Hash limitations. That's going to be in this file then, so I won't worry about that. It is possible to execute dispatch operations where the work group count comes from information stored in the buffer object. This is similar to indirect drawing for vertex data. Ooh! Dispatch compute indirect. 
I wonder if we support that yet. Indirect. Yeah, save it. That's interesting. It doesn't seem like we do. Cool. Right, that's going to be a thing to add. Um, actually, let's get rid of that. Okay. So, let's go to Kettle Issues. Sure. And what would it be? Um, capital doesn't yet support indirect compute dispatch. I think that's interesting, actually. But it's not really a bug, is it? It's just not there at all. Is it a feature request? It's an enhancement. Oh, mercy mild, right, bug. Submit, I will come back to that later. And we will go back to here where we're meant to be. This is the indirect stuff, we won't worry about that now. Um, inputs, compute shaders cannot have any user-defined input variables. Okay, if you wish to, F Mega saying I don't use any plugins. Seeing ads everywhere gives me an eerie kind of comfort. That is, that is very interesting. Getting recommendations for U Matrix. Cool. Okay. Compute shaders have the following built-in variables. Ah, here's our invocations that we were interested in. So the number of workgroups contains the number of workgroups passed to the dispatch function. Um, nice. So in our case, that's a UVEC3. That will be 101.1, if we're correct. Maybe we should make something for playing with this. Um, if we just make so, an array of VEC3s instead of an array of ints, we can pull those back. And that might be rather interesting. Let's have a look. Devstruct G, some more data. Instead of an int, we're going to have make vec3s, but I hate vec3s because uh, they're weird. The layout information is really weird. So I'm just going to do vec4s for now as well. Um, we're going to make a new compute thing. So it's compute func2. Uh, we're going to pass in some more data. Uh, we're going to keep that the same, but all we're going to do is we're going to set the first one. So a ref is going to be zero, and we're going to set it to um, this would be interesting actually. Um, so this is going to be with slots fouls because this is just ugly. Whoop fouls. We're writing into zero. This needs to be a vec four. One, two, three, four. Um, but the first one is GL number of work groups. And this should be the same for every invocation. So this should be fine. Um, test compute func two. Test compute pipeline two. We test compute func two. Let's go swap it out down here. Let's bring up the REPL 
Let's lay this stuff out a little differently because we're going to be experimenting for a while. So we may as well do that. And then hopefully if we do test compute now, it's freaking out. Okay, invalid type for SSBO argument, some more data received, SSBO some test data. Correct. Um, that's because down here we passed in this. We also pulled back that entire array. We have a hundred of things in there. We don't actually need that. Uh, we only need one of them. So let's pull in a subsection of the GPU array, starting at zero and ending at one. Um, let's try that. Ooh. Okay, so SSBO is not obviously of a type of a GPU array, so that won't work. So what we need to do instead is go in here and we need to pull from data. That makes a lot more sense. Let's do that. Wait, that's so many things. Oh, of course, right. Um, hmm, how is the best way to do that? Okay, so we only need, that's cute. Right, so with uh, GPU array as C array, we only need a little bit of the data. We could just go up here and see the fact that it is 100, 1, 1, 0, which is exactly correct. But no, we're not going to do that. Um, we're going to carry on fucking around for even longer. With GPU array as C array, that's it. As C array, cool. Give me C array. Uh, the GPU array is data. Um, then, then what are we going to do? Then we can get. Um, we don't need to pull anymore because we've actually got the data locally now because we've mapped this GPU array down to something local. Um, we can get the actual array out of it, which is what is it called? Some more, oh, that's it. Some more data files from the C array. And then finally, ARFC zero. Hopefully now we've just fucked it all up. There we go. Um, oh, of course, right. Keep going, Chris. Okay, so this array has a dimension of one. We need to get the first element out of that. <laughs> oh, things. A ref zero. Okay, so the first element in this array is going to be one struct of this type. Then we get some more data. They get the values from that struct. And then we get the first thing out of that array. Please, no. What's wrong with you now? Um, that's a good question, actually. What is wrong with you? It's not of type vector. Am I using a ref instead of a ref C? Yes, of course I am. Somebody in the chat has probably already told me this. It's what I get. Finally, good. Okay. <laughs> so we ran the compute shader. It did some stuff. And then it returned, and we got the value out of that data, and we can see that it is the size of our work group. If we take our, uh, where is it, make compute space, we can see that it's got a size of 100, 1, 1, 100, 1, 1. And it's got a zero on the end because we had to pack it into a VEC4 because I don't like VEC3s. Fine. Okay, right, so let's back here again. Um... Yeah, App, App Block Plus did some acceptable ads program. Yeah, I did switch over. I'm pretty sure I switched over on here too to uBlock Origin. Yeah, uBlock Origin for the ad stuff and no script for just dealing with the endless piles of shit that's stuck inside websites. Um, Zulu was uh, just about to point out the AREF. Thank you very much. We still do need the, the bell. We need the bell. Um, oh, that's cool. Okay, so now we've got this. 
what would be a good way to test out the local size thing? If we did a bigger local size, um, what would be cool is if we had a, an SSBO with atomic integers, and then we could increment it once from every invocation of the shader. Then we can make a compute space with size one, but a local size of like 10 by 10 or something like this, have it increment the atomic integer, and then we should see that result back being 100 in one spot, which is cool. Remember, we're going to have to do, start doing with atomics and all kinds of stuff because in this case, we actually have 100 different invocations all writing to the same place, and that is completely racy. We don't know which one won. Um, it turned out that we were writing the same thing, so it wasn't the biggest deal, um, but it's still kind of gross, so we're going to need to manage that. Anyway, that's num work groups. Then we've got work group ID. Um, so we can actually illustrate this problem, uh, gl work group ID, um, by doing this. Doot, not that, this dude. And we see this time we got 96. In fact, we're getting 90. Oh, there's 99, 96. So, yes, we get different results because different invocations are racing to write that data. And it's one of the later ones, which is interesting, but that's about it. Um, GL local invocation. Okay, this is something we haven't looked at yet. This is the current invocation of the shader within the work group. Each of the X, Y, Z coordinates will be on the half open range, blah, 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 blah. Okay, that's cool. Um, again, it's a UVEC 3, so let's try that. So all of ours are 1 by 1, 1, 1. So these should always be the same, which is neat. So let's um, go and play with that. Uh, local invocation ID. How dare. Get out of my way. Okay, so each time we're getting 0, 0, 0, which makes sense. Because the local size is 1 by 1 by 1, so the only index is going to be 0. Neat. Um, let's just set this to 10 and see if we ever get any other results. Oh, look, there, there we got 9. Yeah, okay, so it was the last one in the local group that wrote there. That makes sense. Nice. I like playing with these things. Okay, global invocation ID. This value uniquely identifies this particular invocation of the compute shader among all vocations of this compute dispatch call. It's a shorthand for this math. Yeah, that makes sense. So let's just write that out too. Global invocation ID. Oh, it's global. Oh, there it is. I just was typing wrong. Okay. All key. 99, 96, 96, 99, 99. Oh, yeah, in this case, it's not super interesting because um, we're doing one by one by one and I have a, a local space of 100. Let's up this to 10. Hopefully, we see something a bit more interesting. <laughs> we see the same one. Oh, there's our 999. So, yeah, we're getting the last invocation of various work groups um, racing to write that data. No problem. Cool. So far, no surprises. And then this one, local invocation index. What does that mean? This is a 1D version of local invocation ID. Oh, that's neat. Huh. Okay. That's helpful. I like it. And so, yes, normally in GLSL, uh, you write this like this. Um, so you specify, you're specifying kind of the input to the compute shader, uh, which is this layout, so that the various sizes. Um, by default, the local size is a 1. Um, you can specify just the x or x and y coordinates, but they must be integral constant expressions values greater than 0. That's interesting. I have this odd feeling that I don't allow you to only specify some of them. No. That's interesting. I don't know why. It's perfectly legal to set the values to nil, but we require you to declare something. All right. Well, that's um, different from the GL spec, but also not harmful. Um, if we want to see... Okay, I'll just knock my mouse out of the way. 
Um, but if you don't want to knock your mouse out of the way and you do want to see uh, what this compiles to, then as usual we can use pull G and nothing happens because science. Let's try again. Um, th what happened there was I had recompiled this, but I hadn't then gone and recompiled this, I think. When I first, when I run this, you can see it was uploading. So it actually did the compilation, the upload to the GPU then, and then it had cached it, I guess. Okay, so we can see that that layout thing here is specified. Local size, x equals 10, y equals one, z equals one in. And then we've got the definition of our SSBO buffer. And then we've got the value we're writing out here. That's cool. So, so far, so relatively simple. We're going to have to get used to specifying our work group and local sizes and when it's good to do what there. Um, but yeah, that's, that's going to be useful. We're also going to have to find out what the equivalent of that is in DirectX because I don't know. Uh, compute shaders do not have outputs. If you want to have a compute shader generate some output, write it somewhere. We're already doing that and that's fine. Yeah, let's actually, let's just look. Image load store is that thing that lets you write to images or... Remember that textures are a complicated structure um, that hold a number of images. Images are 1D, 2D, or 3D arrays of data uh, that can be looked up by sampling functions in GLSL. So this was added in 4.3, and this was added in, oh, in 4.2. Okay, so if you don't have 4.3 and you do want to use, you do want to do storage, then maybe you have to use this, assuming that you don't support this ARB, so maybe, I don't know. I'd be very surprised to see this and not the other one, I must admit. I haven't supported this yet in Capital. I really should, but it's uh, it hasn't been interesting to me yet, and there's a lot of other things that need need doing as well. The big one being uh, working with state. As I can see as well from half 11 right now, we are not getting this uh, compute shader written in the next half an hour, but... We are getting through this research, which is which is something we need to do. And I'm really glad to be back doing this, by the way. It's lovely to be with you. Chat is saying, I think you can just use ints and atomic add. That is exactly what I believe you can do. Um, using uh, atomic, uh, yeah, atomic counters or atomic add. Let's look up the GLSL documentation for that. Atomic add performs a topic addition on the data. Do doodly doodly doodly. Um, takes a uint and a uint or an int and an int. Let's try it out. Um, yeah, fuck it. Let's just do it. Cool. So let's go to this one. And. Let's actually look at the documentation again because I wasn't paying attention. First thing is the variable to use as the target of the operation, and then this is the data. Okay, cool. Right, so let's do that. Let's do atomic add. The destination is this. Actually, yeah, in this case, it's just going to be zero, isn't it? We're going to get the vowels. Ugh, I don't like this. I want to use with slots. It's way tidier. Vowels, whoop. Yep, atomic add vowels. We want to add one. We want to get rid of this. We want to change this to be like 10 by 20 by 3. And then we're going to compile it. And then we are going to go down here. And we are going to change things again. We're going to change it back. I don't really take a copy of this function. Should I? Yes. Um, test compute two and test compute, and let's change this back to what was the original whoop? It was S S B O test data. Okay, S S B O test data. Great, and make a compute space. Pass it in. Wait on the thing. Then we need to get the results back. Um, we're actually going to do it in exactly the same way. In fact, I think that code might even be the same. So let's do this and this and say test compute. 
No! Valid type for SSBO arguments. I haven't gotten updated things properly. Let's go back to... That's SSBO test data. This is gets SSBO test data. I wonder what I've done wrong here. It's something really simple. We're going to see it very soon. Um, apparently, I'm not passing in the right thing in MacG. It should be. Required some more data. Received SSPO type data. That sounds like I didn't change the two here to not two. Um, and we got a really ugly number, which makes some sense because we're trying to atomic add. Why does that look like a... Hmm. Hmm. Um, something's a little fucky here. Okay, so SSBO test data. Then rate of 100 ints. And... We were doing atomic add. On this array of ints, the first element is in this. So why? Oh, I know why, because we're using, again, in this, we're using some more data, and it should be uh, SSBO, oh, mercy, SSBO test data. There we go. Vowels, uh, yeah. There we go, 60,000. All right, um, let's change this again down to one. 600. Okay, so we made one invocation. We said, hey, run one work group. And we had our local size of 10 by 20 by 3, which is 600 times. And so it ran this one work group with 600 invocations of this. And we wrote using atomic add once. Okay, we added one for each time there was an invocation. And that got written into the first element of this array, and then we pulled it back. And that is 600, which is exactly what we expect. Good. Okay. And then, of course, when we uh, increase the size of the compute space, doot, we got 60,000, which, of course, is 100 times more than this. So 100 invocations, 600 local invocations. Very nice. Um, well, that's very good. It's nice to know that atomics are easy to work with. Um, I would be very interested to see what the largest practical size of this is because sharing data between uh, things is going to require, again, barriers and synchronization and stuff like that, which is going to be expensive for us on the GPU. So I imagine you want to keep this as small as is practical and often change your um, change the way you're doing something rather than forcing data transfer if you can. I mean, there's some places where it's not avoidable, but um, yeah. Hey, look at this. Shared variables. That's the next topic. Um, so. Jay's is saying, but you're reading it like an array of 100 vec4s. Absolutely, I am. Thank you for being ahead of me. And the bell is there. Um, do you have support for texture arrays? I've seen them used recently for texture exercises. Yes, we do. Um, if you do make texture, it has a lot of arguments. So the initial contents are going to be nil. Uh, we'll set the dimensions to be 100 by 100. And then if we look down in here, we have element type. We better specify that. So let's say element type is a uh, uint 8 vec4. Um, and... We're not doing map maps. We do have a layer count. And that is what you use for your arrays. Layer is the term that they used for that. Um, it's mip map levels, but array layers. Um, and so we are going to specify layer count. And we'll say 10. Um, and what we get back is a texture 2D array uh, where the textures are 100 by 100 and we've got 10 layers. And then what you're able to do, if we do def var temp 4 is that, 
fuck you, just because I can't type. Um, let's do continue and try that again. Um, def var, which is how you spell def var. Um, we can then do text ref on temp4. Temp4? I hope not. Layer, <laughs> layer 0, layer 1, layer 2. These are all the same size, of course, because every element of a texture array is the same size. Uh, but yes, you can combine these so you can do... Can you do texture? Yeah, you can do cube array textures and things like this and all that kind of stuff. Completely, or it should be totally supported, so do play with that. Um, Jason was saying a bit, talking about um, core local group sizes and all that kind of stuff. Jason is saying it varies pretty wildly, but there's also hardware limits and how big you can make a block. Like, can't have a block size larger than the number of CUDA cores in a given processor. Um, and with some and some GPUs have multiple processors. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, the numbers I'm used to is in the 512 to 1024 range. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> so saying, read this out loud. Divar temp four is <laughs> temp four. Ah, words. No. Ah, right. I'm not even going to try and speak. And then he goes back to the thing he has to read. Oh, good. How enjoyable for everyone. All right. So shared variables. Global variables and compute shaders can be declared with the shared storage qualifier. The types of such value variables are shared between all invocations within a work group. You cannot declare any opaque types as shared, but aggregates, arrays, and structs are fine. At the beginning of the work group, these values are uninitialized. Also, the variable declaration cannot have initializers. So this is illegal. If you want to initialize, a shared variable to a particular value, then one of the invocations must explicitly set the variable to that value, and only one invocation must do so due to the following. Memory coherency. Um, we will get into this in a minute. The first thing you need to find out is, did I add support for shared variables? Because we're probably going to need them. And if I did, how the fuck do we use them? So... How I would have thought I would added it is to go and shared um, and then have foo be like an int. It compiled. How interesting. And then we can do test compute 2. And now let's just do pull g on uh, test pipeline 2. Look at that. Shared int foo is defined. And it's great that I put it up here because we can't define an initial value anyway. So that actually works really well. Oh, good job, past Chris. What were you saying, Indigo, up past Chris being the enemy of future Chris? Ha <laughs> ha! That guy's written some code for me. That's great news. Uh, cool. So now we do know we have that. Um, fond of him saying words. What a bunch of bastards. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Let's, uh, let's look at shared memory coherency. Uh, shared variables ac uh, access shared variable access uses the rules for incoherent memory access. This means that the user must perform a certain synchronization in order to ensure that shared variables are visible. Shared variables are ooh, okay. So shared variable access uses the rules for incoherent memory access. Incoherent memory access. Oh goody. There's lots and lots of writing here. Oof! I remember adding support for... Um, <laughs> adding support for compute shaders to Vario was actually very simple. Um, because there's not a lot syntactically you need to do. There's not... There's not that much there. Everything is really done by the user, but everything's done by the user. So we, so we have to, we have to look at this and at least get a vague idea of what's going on. Indigo answers my yelling. Uh, pass backers are still the enemy. Wait around the corner with a baseball bat. Who gave him a baseball bat? And where is it now? God damn it! 
past baggers. <laughs> it compiled. How interesting. That needs to be a poster on the wall behind my screen. Yes. <laughs> absolutely Jay's saying that being said varying the block size doesn't actually matter a whole lot it's usually constrained by other stuff and having more blocks increases the scheduling load yeah so I was imagining uh, Jace you can call me out for this I was imagining if you set the local size beyond what the hardware supports that you then get scheduling dependencies between the invocations because that's the only way you could have that kind of memory memory access work across those um which should be fine because i mean like it only needs to behave as if everything's happening concurrently i mean it, there's probably there will probably be a valid implementation for everything to run by one by one um because barriers would just be no ops in that case um but yeah it's uh it gives the scheduler more flexibility but it means more stuff to schedule yes Okay, so I'm, I'm thinking that obviously we would want to keep our... Okay, you can't actually make the local size that large. Ooh, interesting. So it'll just fail to compile. The driver won't allow it. Nice, okay. Well, that's not nice. That's that's interesting because we have to specify this. We have to kind of hard specify these values, but we don't know what the right values are. So I'm guessing there's like common work group sizes, sort of common local sizes that work everywhere, like a 32 or whatever sized thing always get 32s thrown around that's a safe bet okay this is a lot of stuff do we want to read a bit more in this first because this is the short version i think so maybe we should do that god damn why is my it's not actually running which keeps threatening to run which is a rather awkward thing to feel when you're trying to be on stream okay Shared memory coherency. Shared variable access uses the rules for incoherent memory access. This means that the user must perform certain synchronization in order to ensure that the shared variables are visible, as we said before. Shared variables are all implicitly declared coherent so that you don't need to and can't use that qualifier. However, you still need to provide the appropriate memory barrier. Okay, so when we read this, this is going to be explained. So some of this might not be that useful yet. The usual set of memory barriers is available to compute shaders but they also have access to memory barrier shared and this barrier is specifically for sharing for shared variable ordering group memory barrier acts like memory barrier acts like memory barrier ordering memory writes for all kinds of variables but it only orders read and writes for the current work group That's interesting. Because I'm surprised there's any order guarantees made outside the work group. Because I thought that was kind of the point. While all invocations within a work group are said to execute in parallel, that doesn't actually mean you can assume that all of them are executing in lockstep. If you need to ensure that invocation has written to some variable so that you can read it, you need to synchronize execution with the invocations, not just issue a memory barrier. Ooh, you still need the memory barrier though. <laughs> hey. Okay, to synchronize reads and writes between invocations within a work group, you must employ the barrier function. Okay, so we have sim we have separate barriers and memory barriers, um, which is good. That makes sense. That well, I'll need a quick refresher again to make sure that I I have those the right way around in my head because. It's very rarely I need to deal with those uh, primitives um, directly in the kind of code that I write. And when I do, I normally revise a little before I do it because I don't want to fuck it up. So yes, I don't normally have that stuff fresh in the mind. To synchronize reads and writes uh, between invocations within a work group, you must employ the barrier function. This, this forces the explicit synchronization between all invocations in the work group execution within the work group will not proceed until all other invocations have reached this barrier cool once past the barrier all shared variables previously written across it, all inv invocations in the group will be visible of course we have a sh we have our shader and then halfway through we stick one of these barriers and that means everything's going to essentially wait there more or less until um and when they are all there 
then execution can resume and you can assume that things written before there have been written everywhere. Sounds like something said worse than what was said here, so why not? Jay says 32 definitely, that's the minimum warp size I've seen in every processor needs at least one warp. Yes. Uh, at the bottom it gives some good limit info. Excellent, cool. So we will get down there in time. Um, what we'll probably do is we'll keep reading because we're so close to the end now. Ooh, limitations. Oh. Um, and then, I mean, it's 45 now. We'll start reading memory model, maybe? But to be honest, it's probably a good place to stop. And then we'll have to get into that next week because we do need a bit of an understanding of this. I mean, it's up to you guys, actually. In the remaining time, like, again, I'm fine reading this on stream. Um... But of course, I could go and revise this in my own time, uh, so you don't have to watch me re-learn all this stuff. Um, so it's up to you. Yell in the chat what you want to see, because you're the folks that are watching. I just get to do this for myself. Um, there are limitations on how you can call barrier. However, compute shaders are not as limited as tessellation control shades of the use of this function. I've never used them in tessellation control shaders. That's cool. Uh, barrier can be called from flow control but it can only be called from uniform flow control. Oh, goody. Okay, all expressions that lead to evaluation of a barrier must be dynamically uniform. That's a thing we'll need to get into a definition of as well, because that's a fun one. In short, if you execute the same compute shader, no matter how many different, no matter, oh, sorry, no matter how different the data they fetch is, every execution must hit the exact same set of barrier calls in the exact same order. Otherwise, serious errors may occur. Cool. So that's good. Um, so basically, it's going to be within the warp, maybe that, within the work group, everything, um, the, the variables that are used for conditionals are always going to need to result in the same branch being taken, I think is what that means. Um... Alrighty, Pom Pump, I will catch you next time. Let's just finish this off. So, quickly, atomic operations. We've already played with these a little. And there's more information there. There's a number of them that can be done on stuff. Hurrah! Um, all of the atomic functions return the original value. That makes sense. That's good. Very common kind of things. So, yes, our usual suspects. Adds and min and max and add and or and xor and exchange. And... Compare swap. If the current value of mem is equal to compare, then mem is set to data, otherwise it's left unchanged. Oh, that's good. Cool. Limitations. The max number of work groups that can be dispatched in a single dispatch call is defined by this. Let's go and look it up. Um, GL gets There we go. That's our numbers. Well, that's interesting. What are the values? Um, representing the X, Y, and Z coordinates of the maximum work group count. Attempting to call dispatch compute with values that exceed this range is an error. Ooh. Really? Because look at that. So that means we can only use two axes of the compute space? That's really interesting. Am I reading that right? That's assuming that that's what glget is doing. Yeah. How cool. With index being on the close range. A 
Okay, that's very interesting. Let's have a look at that again. Get integer i. We're getting the index is 0 and the size is 3. Guess that's right. Get integer i, which is what they recommend using. Are they using iv? Wow, okay. But look though, note that the minimum no, note that the minimum these values must be is sixty five thousand odd in all three axes. Okay, so that suggests that either my driver implementation is non-conformant, doubt it, or the way that CL OpenGL is querying this is incorrect. That's very interesting. Let's have a look at this now. Because that's super interesting. Okay, so um, come on. Oh, God, why can't I do things? Um, let's use the internal functions get integer. Um, I, V, target, index, and data. Let's look at how this works. Oh, for goodness sake. This one here, GL int data, this is where the result is going to be written. Okay, so for us to do this, we are going to need to CFI with C, no, with foreign object. Um, var is going to be val, and type is going to be int, and count is going to be one. Actually, do we need to specify count? No. Um, the target, the index is going to be zero, and the data is going to be val, and then we can do, what is it called, um, CFFI, uh, that's memref, that's what it's called, memref, maref, uh, the pointer is val, and the type is int, okay, wow, okay, so far, Ah, now there we go. That is more what we expected. Notice that the first result did match, but the other two are the 65,000 that we were expecting. So it looks like we have a little bug in, um, in CL OpenGL. So I will need to, after the stream, file this. Um, so how did we do this before? It was yeah. Wow, that's getting different results each time. <laughs> Maybe it's just that GL get star is not meant to support this. In which case, it's fine. But I'll still report it anyway because it's interesting and. I've got very used to GL get just doing the right thing, so it might be meant to. Um, to file. Um, right. What have we got left? Seven minutes. Let's look at those restrictions then. This must be queried with this. Um, we did that. Attempting to call, blah, blah, blah. That's good. Minimum is 65,000 odd. That's fine. There are limitations on the local size as well. Indeed, there are two sets of limitations. There's a general limitation on the local size dimensions queried with, with this one, in the same way as above. Um, with the minimums being 1,000, 24, 1,024, and 64, 
there's another limitation, the total number of invocations within a work group, that is the product of those numbers. Um, the minimum value here is 1,024. And there's also a limit for the total storage size of all shared variables in a compute shader. Woo! The required minimum is 32 kilobytes. So again, you don't want to go too crazy with your shared variables, which again, kind of makes sense anyway. Um, I can't imagine that having that much being synced around is a good idea. Um, all right. Okay, so we have five minutes remaining. Questions, comments, and all the rest, do throw them out now. If not, we will call this a day. And we'll uh, come back next week and do some more stuff. Um, given that there are no comments um, wishing we go through all of this on stream, I think what I'll do is I will read up the uh, memory model stuff in my own time. And then hopefully next week we can just get coding because we really need to get this thing translated. Um, and it's kind of interesting. We've got to find out how to specify the sizes. Now it almost looks like you don't specify kind of local invocations. Um, maybe that gets specified from the CPU side as well. Um, Jace is saying really it's the syncing that causes trouble, not the block size itself. Okay, dokie. Um, neat. Yeah, this is interesting. So a pen and structure buffer this is like an, an SSBO with an atomic int as its um, index for writing in, I believe. Uh, read write buffer, I think this is our SSBO normal. Sampler states, I'll find out structured buffers. Read write texture 2D, oh, read write, really? Oh no, RW might not be read write in this case, we'll see. Um, anyway, oh no, that's an output, maybe. Oof, there's going to be a lot to break through. Anyway, I think that's the lot. So, thank you so much for stopping by. It's good to be back. Let's uh, let's do these again more regularly. Um, the Kickstarter is done now, which was amazing. Uh, but I'm very glad to be getting back to back to normal work and kind of regular weeks. So, until next time, thank you so much for stopping by. Peace.